Hello everyone, good morning. All right, so we have about 30, 30 four students already in. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Okay, so today we are going to be uh, looking at the uh, UART module of the KL25Z, all right, and we're going to learn how to sort of configure that. All right, and uh, that is important because uh, we are basically going to be using that as the main uh, protocol all right, for the Wi-Fi module to communicate with the KL25Z. All right. uh, so in today's lecture, we will first cover the basics and then we will look at the demo all right, where you can get the um, uh, a serial interface working. All right. And then after that, we will look into how the ESP32 is going to be connected, all right, and uh, and then we will sort of understand how the whole thing is going to uh, come together, all right. Uh, so let me get started. Okay, can everybody see my uh, screen here? Okay, thank you. All right, so serial communications uh, is something you have uh, sort of been exposed to before, all right? And we're going to look at it from the ARM and the KL25Z perspective and try to understand how it works, all right? Um, yeah, so the KL25Z itself has a very comprehensive range of communication protocols, all right? Um, the UART, okay, uh, that is what we're going to be focusing on. Plus at the same time, you have SPI and I2C, all right? And all three of them are basically have the same objective. You want to serialize data, correct? And by serializing data, you reduce the number of lines you need, all right, to send data uh, from one point to another. Okay, so that is the whole idea of uh, serialization. Okay, so if you ever had a chance to look at very old, uh, let's say printers or whatever in the past, you will see that to connect up a printer uh, in the past, you had a very very big and thick cable. Okay, and the connector had like what, 50 over pins uh, protruding out. Okay, so that was how uh, data used to be transmitted in the past, all parallel. All right, so of course, uh, that was very inefficient, all right, very expensive. So that is where the serial uh, interface helped us a lot. All right, so that is the uh, sort of motivation. Okay, because when you want to communicate through parallel means you need the, uh, sort of the number of pins that uh, for the amount of data that you want to send. Right? So if, imagine that if my data size is uh, 32 bits and if I want to send 32 bits across from one device to another device, then I practically need 32 bits at the least. Right? That is just for the data itself. Then you talk about control, handshaking and so on, then you have more data lines. All right? So it's not a practical solution all right? because uh, as IC chips, get smaller and smaller, the number of pins, okay, that are available for us are lesser, all right, they're more compact, okay, and you want to use those pins more, uh, sort of effectively for a lot of other purposes, okay, instead of just, uh, you know, sort of uh, wasting all those pins for parallel transfer, okay, so that is the idea, all right, behind uh, the whole serial communication, the cost, the mechanical reliability, okay, uh, timing complexity, all right, because now when you serialize, everything comes one after another. Whereas when you go in parallel, okay, different transmission lines, we have some slight variation, so the data might not arrive at the same time and things like that, okay. And of course, the complexity becomes a lot lesser. All right, so this is of course in the past, okay, when you had to communicate through parallel means, all right, and as you can see the number of pins you need sort of goes up, okay? Based on the number of devices you want to connect, okay? So every additional device that you connect, you have to multiply and you keep on adding and adding, all right? So it's not efficient. So the idea of parallel buses uh, was first uh, sort of brought about. And with parallel buses, uh, the idea is you can still uh, transmit serially. I mean, you can still transmit parallelly. Okay, so the data here is still parallel. All right, but all the devices are connected to the same bus. So this data bus is the, is 
sort of uh, consistent across all the peripherals. And then we sort of the manufacturers introduced this thing called a CS, a chip select pin. Okay, a chip select pin. Uh, of course, this could be active low or active high, depending on what chip you're talking about. All right. So this is still used. Okay, this is still used in, uh, let's say, memory interfaces. Okay, most memory chips, okay, uh, I mean, most chips have chip select and is used uh, in, in the case where you want to sort of select or deselect any particular chip. All right, so when you have multiple chips connected to the same bus, okay, then you can sort of activate the appropriate chip select to see which one you want to talk to. All right, so that is where you can use the parallel bus concept, all right, and still keep data parallel, all right, but then you can sort of switch between each device that you are talking to. All right, so of course, if I have four devices, then I need uh, four sort of chip select lines. And besides the data, you also have your control signals, your read write signals and so on. Okay, so those were parallel buses, okay. And of course now uh, we bypass all of that and now we go towards uh, serial data transmission. Okay, so in serial data transmission, you have two ways, one is, uh, synchronous and the other is asynchronous. When you say synchronous, you send the clock together with the signal, the data. Okay, so you have one clock line and you have another data line. All right, so since I'm sending the clock together with the data, all right, the receiver side will sample according to the incoming clock and the data. All right, so that is, uh, one way of sending it, all right? But of course, you need to send both the clock and the data together, okay? Uh, if you do that, of course, you can also have uh, full uh, synchronous, I mean, synchronous full duplex serial data bus. So if you say full duplex, okay? When you say full duplex means basically you can have read and write at the same time, okay? At the same time. Okay, and that is possible because you have one line for in and one line for out. All right, so for the microcontroller, this is the out line and this is the in line. All right, so one line will be used to send data out and one line to receive data in. And since you have two separate lines, you can have what you call the full duplex mode. Okay, what happening at the same time. All right, the other one is if you do not need to have this feature, you can just choose to have half duplex mode. Okay, in half duplex mode, you can uh, have both send and receive, okay, but then you do it only on a single line. Okay, so on this single line, you transmit and receive. Okay, but then it is not at the same time because it's only a single line. All right, so that is another way of uh, configuring your devices. Now, the other more popular option that most microcontrollers implement is the asynchronous mode. In the asynchronous mode, basically what we do is we eliminate the clock line. All right, we eliminate the clock line and we allow the uh, data to just be transmitted. Okay, so of course, uh, to transmit and to receive, you still need a clock. Correct, so that clock is generated locally. Okay, that means the transmitter has its own clock. Okay, it has its own built-in clock and the receiver also has its own built-in clock. Okay, so of course, in this situation, both of them need to be already uh, sort of agreed upon. That means if I'm transmitting at 9,600 bits per second, then the receiver must also receive at 9,600 bits per second. All right, so that is the uh, first step that we need to do. Make sure that both the transmitter and receiver have already agreed upon a clock rate. Okay, and subsequently, uh, when I start to transmit data out on my line. All right, so there is always a idle uh, voltage level. Okay, and the idle voltage level will always be the high. Okay, the one. So this is where the line is considered idle. Okay. And what happens is the receiver, okay, the receiver always looks out for the start. 
So when is the start bit? The start bit is when the line is pulled low. Okay, so the moment the receiver detects this happening, that means the line is suddenly pulled low, then it knows that that is the start of a new incoming data packet. Okay, and if you look over here, basically what it will do is, from the first uh, transition that it detects, it will look wait for one and a half bits. Okay, why one and a half bits? Because one bit later, so each bit has a certain duration. So when the start bit is over, the first data bit will come. All right, but you do not want to sample while the data is still transitioning. Okay, you have to always remember that we draw data like this, all right? But in reality, it is always slow. Okay, there's always some rise time and uh, fall time associated with any digital signal. Okay, so because of that, you want to minimize any error by sampling right in the middle of the data bit. So what we do is, when the start bit is detected, we wait one and a half bits. So we wait one and a half bits, what happens is we are somewhere in the middle of the first data bit. Okay, and subsequently we just add one. So this is plus one, plus one, and so on. Okay, until we finish the number of bits. Okay, and when we finish the number of bits, then we have the stop bit uh, from the transmitter side to know that we have completed the transmission. Okay, so this is basically uh, the general idea okay, of how you transmit data serially. Okay, so of course, besides configuring the uh, clock beforehand, you also need to configure the number of bits. Okay, so how many bits am I going to transmit? Okay, it could be seven bits, could be eight bits, could be nine bits. Okay, so most microcontrollers usually support eight and nine. Okay, some may also support seven. All right, then you also have parity bit. Okay, we'll come to that in a while. Okay, but parity is basically for error uh, checking to know whether the, there's been any error in the incoming data. Okay, and finally you have the stop bit. All right, so of course, uh, as with all data communication, there can be errors uh, introduced. So we can detect error through parity and through other uh, mechanisms that the controller already has built in for us. Okay, so we will explore that later. All right, so this is basically, I think, what we talked about. All right, where we have the start bit, the entire message, uh, which is the data, okay, and then the stop bit. Okay, so of course, the entire packet is the start bit all the way to stop bit, all right, and that is considered one message byte or one packet, all right, and of course, um, the agreements have to be made beforehand, the number of bits, okay, whether you want parity, okay, and what is the speed. Okay, uh, so of course, this is the most basic form of transmission. That means, for example, if I take 8 bit, okay, then I transmit and receive uh, one bit at a time, uh, so one byte at a time. All right, and I can interpret uh, the information within that one byte. Okay, if you have a lot of information to transmit, all right, then you have to create a structure, wherever right? you put everything into a, a structure and then you transmit and receive uh, a structure of, 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 uh, which consists of many multiple bytes. Okay, so similar to your uh, EPP2 where you have uh, the header, you have the data, you have a checksum and so on. Right? So if you have a lot of information, then you may need to create some form of structure to hold the data and then you can transmit. Okay, so in our lab, we're going to be first looking at the basic one, all right, the, fundamental this one byte approach okay and then later on we will look into the structure approach okay and of course uh, for the project itself uh, the one byte should be more than enough okay so you don't need to make it so complicated i think one byte to transmit whatever information you need should be more than enough okay to, to decode and take the necessary action okay so let's look at the um, error detection Okay, so the error detection basically is, uh, the concept is you agree, okay, both transmitter and receiver both agree on the parity. Okay, so even parity means the number of ones is even. Okay, so number of ones is even. 
Okay, so for odd means the number of ones is odd. Okay. And uh, let's see what happens. So let's say I have this data over here. Okay, so I have 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay. And let's just say this is my data and I choose uh, odd parity. So when I say odd parity means the uh, number of ones must be an odd number. So now I have six ones, correct? So the parity bit over here has to be a one. Okay, so the total number of ones, okay, number of ones is equals to seven, which is an odd number. All right, so that's the first thing. So the transmitter side must do this. It must generate the parity bit. So this is done by the hardware, all right? You do not need to explicitly write some routine to go and count and insert the bit, no. Okay, the, you just configure it in the hardware and the hardware will uh, generate the parity bit, the correct one, and you will also append it for you during the transmission. All right, and now I transmit over. Okay, so when I transmit over, okay, what the, since we already pre-arranged that I'm transferring 8-bit uh, data plus uh, odd parity. Okay, so it's 8-bit data plus odd parity, okay? Now what is going to happen is when I receive the data, I go to sample. So I get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and I'm supposed to get a 1. So I will check that the data, okay, and the parity, the total number adds up to 1. Okay, now what happens if along the way there is some error? Okay, so let's assume that along the way, one of the bit has a flip. Okay, so one of the bits have a flip. So previously we have seven ones. Okay, we have seven ones over here. And now I have a bit flip, okay, along the way. And once I come to the receiver side, when I count the number of ones, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So instead of seven, I now have six. Correct. But since we already arranged, uh, pre-arranged that it's supposed to be odd parity, then this is wrong. Right, this is wrong. That means this incoming data is has some error. All right. Now the other, uh, so that is of course detection of error. Now, uh, of course, it does not. Uh, it's not foolproof because it cannot detect even number of corrupted bits. So instead of one bit error, if I have two bits that flip, okay, two bits that flip, then what happens? Then the total number of ones now becomes pi, which is correct. Okay, because by odd parity, that means the row number one is the odd number, so it is still correct. Alright, so it is not a foolproof system, it's just one uh, way of uh, sort of generating uh, or, or detecting there is an error. Okay, so of course there are many other mechanisms. You can have a checksum that is generated. You can calculate parity across uh, the rows and columns of multiple bytes, all right, to sort of detect where the error is. Okay, so you can have other mechanisms, okay, but we will not go into that, all right. Um, for now, we'll just take it if, we, if you want to use, we can use parity, okay, and that provides us with a, a very basic level of error detection. Okay, so now, now the next thing is if I detect error, then I, what do I do? Right, what do I do? Because over the transmit side, I send the data and now I receive the data and now I know that this has some error. So since it's error, the first step you will do is you discard this data, all right? You discard the data. Now what is the next step you do? So the next step depends on how you want to design the protocol. Okay, if you have a handshake mechanism, that means every time you send the data and you decode it correctly, or you are able to say there's no error, then you have a, a two-way communication and then you say it's okay or something like that. Okay, so in this case, you can always uh, say okay or not okay. And then the transmitter side can choose to resend the data. Okay, so that is one way of looking at it. 
All right. The other simpler way is I just discard the data and I just wait for the next data packet to come in. All right. So that is of course an easier way, and uh, that is also something that you can also do for the project. Okay. Why? Because your robot doesn't need to move if the receive data has some error. Okay. That means as far as the robot is concerned, when it receives a data, okay. As long as I can decode the data correctly and I can interpret the information, then I carry out that action, whether it's move the motor, light the LED, play the sound, whatever. Okay, but if I detect there is an error, then I just discard it. Okay, why it is fine in this case? Because from a user perspective, all right, if I press a button to move the robot and the robot doesn't move, okay, the natural thing we will do is we press the button again. All right, so since the the reaction is always to resend the data automatically okay from the user perspective it is fine if there is an error and you uh, the user just sends or tries another makes another attempt all right so you don't have to uh, wait for some acknowledgement and then tell you there is an error if, if the robot is not responding you naturally just press the button again okay and see if it responds the second time all right so in that sense, okay, because of the uh, sort of the interface, uh, sort of uh, that we are designing, is easier to just handle it this way. All right, but of course, if you want to uh, have two-way communication and you want to get feedback and so on, that is also uh, up to you to do. All right. Okay, so now let's look at how we can handle uh, asynchronous communication. All right, so in asynchronous communication, all right, we do not know when data is going to come in, all right? Uh, so your transmitter, I mean, your robot, from your robot side, okay? You, you're going to design the robot, okay? And you're going to have the ESP32, okay? And this ESP32 is going to receive commands through your app, okay? So you do not know when this command is going to come in because you have a lot of buttons here. So you do not know when I will press which button. Right, so, but the moment I receive, I might be able to respond. All right. So the, uh, of course, the two options as we have already seen is either polling or interrupt, and definitely the interrupt is the uh, option to take. All right, and that is also specified in your project uh, document. All right, but in the lab, I'm going to show you the polling approach. Okay, but in the lecture slides, we also have the example for the interrupt that you can try on your own. Okay. Now, uh, so the whole idea is. Whenever the app button is pressed, all right, you are going to send a signal okay, to the Wi-Fi and your ESP32 is going to pick up that signal. Once it picks up that signal, it will take that information and transmit to the KL25Z. All right. So this one in more detail, I'll, I'll show in the documents that I've uh, already uploaded. Okay. Uh, so this interface is basically what you need to build. It's only a few wires, okay, but as long as the, the setup, everything is done for the ESP32, okay, according to the document, then you should not have any issue, all right? Now, for the communication and the interrupt, all right, so uh, how do we design the whole sort of framework? Okay, so if I look here, from the serial in interface perspective, I have an interrupt, all right, where I may I have a program where I may want to send some information, I may want to receive some information. Okay, so this is a general idea. Okay, uh, whether we want to use this for a project is also up to you. All right, but this uh, solution that we're going to discuss is basically what we call a circular queue approach, where we have one queue for the TX, the other for the RX. All right, so why is a circular queue uh, a good solution when you are having a serial interface? Because uh, what a circular queue does is it ensures that in the event where a lot of information needs to be sent. All right, so if you look at it, okay, let's say this is my serial interface and I have a lot of data to transmit up. Okay, but it could be that I have multiple tasks trying to send data out. Okay, so it's not maybe only a single task. So I could have a task uh, UI trying to send a data out. I could have a task LED 
trying to send some information out and so on. Okay, ex buzzer trying to send some information out. Okay, so I'm just giving an example. Maybe you have multiple tasks, all want to send information out through the serial interface. Okay, now if multiple tasks may just randomly write, okay, what uh, it becomes a bit tricky when uh, when you when you have a single serial interface, okay, where you have a single uh, sort of byte to hold the data. But right, then when TXUI, for example, write to this buffer, and then before it can start to send, the TX LED go and overwrite or something like that. All right, or you cannot send because the TX UI haven't finished with the sending of the data. Right, so these are some potential issues if let's say you have multiple threads, okay, all want to send data. So you need some form of a buffering mechanism, all right, to hold the data so that the serial interface can send it out as and when it is available. Okay, so that is where this circular queue idea comes in. All right, now in terms of the interrupt, Okay, uh, interface for the KL25Z. We have uh, only a single interrupt. Okay, for the uh, UART for each UART uh, module. Okay, so we have three UART modules: zero, one, and two. Okay, so for each uh, UART module, you have a single interrupt handler, and within the interrupt handler, what you can do is you can check, okay, whether you want to transmit or you want to receive. All right, so within the handler, you can sort of check what has happened and then you can proceed to perform the action. Okay, so you do not have separate interrupt handlers, you have a single interrupt handler for each UART module. Okay, then the transmit and the receive or error handling all is done within the uh, single handler. Okay, so now let's look at this idea of the queue. All right, so the whole idea of the queue is you have a buffer. So in this case, it's just like an array. All right, and inside this array, what happens is you have two, uh, you have pointers that will keep track of uh, the data to read from, okay? And then the data or where to write to. Okay, so as you can see down here, what happens is, all right, when you are reading from the data, so this data came in first. Okay, this came in first, I mean, in a sense earlier, then the second data, and then the third data, and so on. All right, so multiple tasks can write to this sort of buffer, all right, and as and when the uh, new data is to be written, I will write based on the pointer to the tail. Let me say this towards the end of this uh, queue. All right, and when the transmit module is free to perform the transmit all the data, you will do the read, but it will be from the head, that means the top, the top of the queue. All right, so that is the whole concept, of course. And since it's a circular queue, what happens is, when you reach the end, you will just wrap around. Okay, when you reach the end, you will do a wrap around. Okay, so we will see that, all right, uh, how it works. Okay, so this is basically one uh, way in which you can define the queue. So in this case, uh, the size of 32, so 32 bytes of information can be maintained inside the queue. All right, and then I have three uh, pointers here, in a sense, where I point to the, uh, sorry, two pointers to point to the head and tail, and one more is the size, okay? Uh, the amount of space I have. And then I create two separate queues, TX queue and RX queue. Okay, in terms of the code, what happens is when you initialize the queue, you put everything at zero first. Okay, so this is of course not really necessary. Okay, but why it helps is uh, in the event that you are troubleshooting, all right, uh, by making sure that every element has a default value, you can sort of keep track and know maybe what went wrong or did your pointer point to the right location or anything like that. So it can help you with debugging by making sure that everything is uh, cleared by default. Okay, and then the head and tail both point to the same place. Okay, so that is the initialization. Okay, so if the size is zero means that I have no more space, it means empty. Okay, no more space. 
if size is zero, that means I already filled up the entire space. Okay. If it's full means I've uh, sorry, uh, size is zero means it is empty. Okay, that means uh, it is not used yet. Okay, that means it's empty. Okay, that means there is no element inside. No element inside or no data inside. Okay, full means no more space. Okay, that means I've used up all the space available inside the circular cube. Okay, so now this is the important part, the NQ and DQ. Okay, so the NQ and DQ, what does it do? So if I, let's say I look at my Q over here. Okay, so let's say I, I have an initial size of five. Okay, so these are the five spaces that I have inside my queue. And initially what happens is your head also points here, your tail also points here. Correct, because both point to element zero. So this is zero, one, two, three, four. All right, when I say NQ means I want to put an element into the queue. All right, so the first thing I check is, is it full? Okay, so if it is full, then I don't do anything. I say it's failure. Because I cannot put anything into a queue if it is already full. Okay, but if it is not full, then what do I do? Okay, so I take the pointer to the tail, which is currently element zero, and I take my data that I'm sending over here, which is just the new data, and I put it into that location. So this is the array indexing, correct? So I put it into this location. So let's say I pass in a value of seven. So seven will come here. All right, and then what do I do after that? I plus plus my tail. Okay, so my tail, okay, will now point to the next value now. So my tail has now moved. Okay, my tail has now moved to the next element. Okay, so tail is now pointing to one. Okay, now let's say I call again Q and Q and this time I pass in a value of 12. So again, the same thing. If it is not full, I put a value of 12 into where I'm pointing. Okay, and then I move my tail pointer because I have a plus plus there. All right, so I'll move my tail pointer to the next uh, location or next element in the array here. So of course, as you can see here, uh, this Q tail percentage because Q size, this is where you have the wrap around. Okay, that means once I hit five, okay, from four, if I go to five, what happens? It will wrap around back to at, uh, zero. Okay, but that only will happen if my queue is not full. Okay, and when will my queue not be full? That means as long as I'm still reading from the queue. So the reading from the queue comes where? The reading from the queue comes from the DQ function here. So from the DQ function, what will I do? I will check whether it's empty. So if it's empty, there's nothing to read. But if it's not empty, I will take the data by this time pointing to uh, pointed to by the head pointer. All right, so as you can see, I can always fill up my queue first. All right, and then later on, I can start to read. So in this case, when my uh, head is still pointing to the first element, I will dequeue. So what will happen? This data will come out, and my head will now point to the next location. Okay, because after that, I will set the value to zero, and then I will uh, plus plus to the next location. So this value will become zero, and I will increment my head to the next location. Okay, so again, once I do another DQ, I'll do the same thing. This data will be read out, replaced with a zero, and my head pointer will now point to here. Okay. So you can see that if my size, okay, every time I de, uh, 
DQ, I will decrease the size. Okay, if I NQ, I will increase the size. All right, so this will again help me with the empty and full check. All right, to know whether my Q is empty or is it full. Okay, so why make head and tail pointers? Why not just use int? Uh, okay, you. Sorry, your question is you say why not just use int as in. Okay, so the elements here are still uh, sort of integer. Okay, so this tail and head, they are all integers, okay? If you look back at the structure, they are all integers, they are not declared as pointers. Okay, they are not declared as pointers, all right? We are saying that we are pointing to the head or the tail is because the structure itself is declared as a pointer. Okay, the structure itself is declared as a pointer. So when you want to reference elements with a structure pointer, you use this notation here. All right, so the head and tail are, are still integers because they are just keeping track of the index 0, 1, 2, and so on. Okay, they, they are just integer numbers keeping track of the index. Okay, we are using this, uh, this arrow operator is because the Q itself is declared as a uh, pointer to the structure. All right, so that is why we have this notation. All right, so when I want to send data, I can call the NQ function. All right, uh, and I want to de receive data, I can DQ. All right, so this is again, uh, uh, just an idea of how you can implement a queue-based system, all right, to handle uh, is it incoming data or outgoing data, all right. Uh, whether you want to use this or not is, again, uh, an option for you. Okay, you can choose not to use it, all right, like I said, because of the nature of how we are going to run the robot, okay, where we only have a single person sending commands to the robot. So in the sense, uh, it is just going to be a single byte transfer every time. All right. And there is no other source of data coming in. Okay. So in that sense, okay, you don't necessarily have to do this. Okay. You can just take it as a single byte that is going to be read. And once, once I read it, I decode it and then I uh, take the next action. Okay. So of course, when you send the byte over, you need to figure out how you want to pass messages, okay? So in, in terms of passing messages, uh, basically uh, you can look at it based on the actual binary data set, okay? So what do we mean by this, okay? Uh, so the whole idea is you're going to send a single byte of data, okay? So it's eight bits of data. And then what you can do is you can uh, sort of decide how the, bits will be used. All right, so that is something that you can decide. There is no right or wrong here. Okay, so I can say that, okay, maybe these two bits is to, uh, for motor control. This one is for LED, okay? Uh, this one is for audio, okay, and something else, all right? So you can do it this way, okay? Or you can say that, okay, uh, instead of this way, I will say that, uh, I will maybe set aside four bits for the actual function. I mean, this four bits can uh, represent 16 different functions. And for each of those functions, the actual value. Okay, so for example, if I say 0, 0, 0, 1 is LED, then this value here can, can tell me whether it is uh, blinking or running or what. Okay, so the decoding part is up to you to decide, all right, uh, based on how you want to design the whole uh, protocol. Okay, so now let's go into some specifics of the KL25Z, all right, to understand uh, how we're going to use it here. 
All right, so for the Freedom KL25Z, you can see all these connector pins here. Okay, and uh, those in the green are the ones uh, where we can use them for UART purposes. Okay, so for the lab, okay, and for the demo, uh, now I'm going to use a particular port. All right, so what we're going to use is we're going to use port E. Okay, so let's look at port E. Okay, and see which are the pins we're going to be using. All right, so can we open up our data sheet? Okay, first and look at port E, uh, 23, 22, 21, and 20, and see where it maps to, which UART module it maps to. Okay, can you all tell me that? Okay, port E. Okay, 23, 22, 21, 20, tell me which uh, UART module it maps to. Okay, so if you go back to your multiplexing section, okay, you can see that the uh, UART uh, 2021 maps to uh, UART 0, okay, over here, and 2223 maps to UART 2. Okay, so we are going to be using UART 2, okay, for the lab, okay, but if you want to switch to any other UART or any other pins later on, it's up to you. Okay, so as always, there are multiple options you have, correct? Right? Because the same peripheral can be mapped to a few different pins. Okay, so if I'm going to use port E2223, so you can see the UR2 here is mapped to the alternate for function. Okay, so in the multiplexing later on, we need to make sure this is configured correctly. Okay, and I also need to make sure the power clock gating is activated for the UART2 module plus the port E module. All right, so these are the things you need to already be quite familiar with. All right, if I want to use a module, I need to make sure that particular port power is activated, the peripherals power is also activated, and then I can go ahead and do the necessary configuration. Okay, so that is what you're going to be using for uh, the lab. Okay. Now, in terms of clock gating, okay, I think we already know, uh, see this before. So for the UART modules, it's basically the SCGC4 register. I need to activate the UART2. All right, so for the UART communications, okay, so this is, I think we already gone through this before, so I will not repeat that. The start bit data parity and the stop bit. Okay, that part is the same. Uh, reading receiver wise is the same as well. All right, you will wait for the start bit, one and a half bits later, it will start sampling and then it will carry on until it completes the end and then it has the stop bit. All right, so the protocol, like I said, must always be agreed upon. The order of the data bits, the number of data bits, the start bit, the stop bit, and how long a bit lasts. Okay, that means the baud rate. Okay, in terms of the UART module, we have the uh, UART zero, okay, uh, and we do not use this because it is currently being used while we are in debug mode. Okay, so we don't use the UART zero, okay, but we are free to use UART one or UART two. Okay, so if you do not want the pins that I'm showing you for the lab, later on you can switch to some other pins or some other, uh, the UART one as well. All right, so in terms of the transmit and receiver, okay, so as you can see down here, uh, basically what you have is you have your data register here, UART. This is the data register you write to. And once you write to that register, okay, and you start the transmission, you get copied over to the shift register. And the shift register basically just starts to shift the data out. Okay, and as you can see, the shifting is the least significant bit first all the way up to the most significant bit, right, zero to seven. Okay, 
and then the next thing is this the parity so as i said the parity bit is automatically generated by the hardware okay and what we need to do is we need to enable the parity if you want and also tell whether it's even or odd okay so the parity generation automatic okay and once it is done you will generate the eighth bit okay and put it over here okay the additional bit okay and put it over here to uh, uh, as the parity bit for the signal all right and once that is done all right then you can also uh, i mean that basically so sort of configures the the main data being transmitted out and that is the data you will see over here okay depending on what data you are writing okay the rest of these control signals okay we are going to look into that okay as usual there is always the ability to generate interrupt if you want all right so in our case okay we are not actually using the transmitter from the kl25z we are more interested in the receiver because the kl25z is actually going to receive data Okay, this trans transmitter you can use it like I said if you want to have two-way communication. Okay, if you want your KL25Z to be sending data back, okay, to the app or to the Wi-Fi or something like that, then you can use a transmitter. Okay, if not, you just receive data. To receive data, basically you have uh, incoming data over at the receive uh, data pin. Okay, and once uh, that received data comes in, okay, what will happen is it will generate the, uh, or it will go through some uh, parity, again, generation and, and, and logic to check, all right, and then it will transfer the data over here. Okay, now, of course, when you are receiving the data, okay, and as well as transmitting the data, you need to make sure that the clocking is the same, all right? So that is where the clocking section here comes in, the baud rate generator, all right? And of course, as usual, if you want to have any uh, interrupts uh, being uh, sort of activated, I can also do that. So I can have interrupt requests generated if I want to uh, sort of uh, generate interrupts whenever the incoming data is detected. All right, so the other thing that is also unique to hear uh, this kl 2 z is the oversampling. All right, so normally what we do is we sample uh, once during each interval. All right, that means we're coming back here. Okay. Uh, okay, so normally, for example, what happens is when I have a pulse, okay, let's say this is my pulse duration. Okay, we will sample here. Okay, and we'll take the value. Okay, but what uh, this um, sort of uh, KL25Z does is it actually oversamples by a certain number of times. All right, so for example, over here, if this is my pulse width, I can oversample four times. All right, and the oversampling. All right, the whole idea of oversampling is to improve the noise immunity. That means, okay, if there is happens to be any uh, spike or glitch, okay, uh, and it happened to be exactly where you are sampling the data and you only do it once, then there's a high chance you'll get it wrong. All right, so imagine that I'm sampling here in the middle. All right, and it just so happened that there is a glitch, okay, uh, and then suddenly at this point of time there is a glitch and the line goes low. All right, and then I would have made a wrong interpretation of that particular pulse. All right, so by oversampling, I can sample multiple times. All right, and then I can sort of do some uh, winner takes all, okay, kind of thing where the, the maximum uh, value that I get, all right, from the samples, the one with the highest will always win. All right, so that helps to sort of improve the noise immunity, okay, uh, and prevents this kind of a uh, spikes or glitches from giving us some wrong value. So since we are using UART1 or UART2, we are going to be having a fixed oversampling of 16 times. Right, so that is already built into the hardware. So with that, 
16 times oversampling, okay, what happens is your baud rate value, okay, that you want is calculated based on this formula here, which is UART module clock divided by the register value multiplied by 16. Okay, so this multiplied by 16 is something we cannot change. Okay, it is already fixed, it's already built in the hardware. Okay, so all we need to do is since we know we are sampling, uh, we're doing 16 times over sampling, we just factor that in into the formula. So the baud rate that we want, okay, will give me the uh, will be allow me to calculate the actual SBR value. So this SBR value is actually the baud rate register. Okay, so if you remember, your Arduino one also the same thing, right? Once you decide the baud rate, so if I say I want 9,600 bits per second, okay, uh, then what it means is I want to be able to uh, configure both the transmitter and receiver, the registers to operate at this particular uh, sort of frequency when I'm sampling the data. All right, so uh, for each value that I want, I need to write some some amount into a particular register. All right, so in this case, the register is the SBR register. And this SBR register is actually 13 bits. Okay, and since it's 13 bits, okay, we need to break it up into two separate registers. Okay, so we will look at that uh, when I'm showing you the demo. Now, to transmit the data, okay, what I can do is, so in the polling approach, what I can do is I can check whether the Transmit data register is empty. Uh, so transmit data register empty, flag is set. Okay, so there is this register, S1 register, and inside that there is a flag. Okay, so that is transmit data register is empty. Okay, so if it's empty, then I can put in some new data and you can start to be set up. When I'm receiving, I can also check the same uh, register, but the RDRS. So that is receive data register full. That means I have received a new data. So when, it's, when I receive a new data, then I can go ahead to uh, read the data and, uh, and process it. Okay, so these are the registers. Okay, uh, this C1 register, we don't really need to use it except if you want parity. Okay, if you want parity, then you can configure these two bits. Okay, so that is again up to you if you want or you do not want. This C2 register is used to do two things. Firstly, this two, that is to enable or disable the transmitter and receiver. And the other one is, uh, if I want to uh, enable interrupt. So transmit interrupt enable and receive interrupt enable. Right, so this allows me to configure them for interrupt mode, okay? It, okay, which is also what you're supposed to be doing later on. Okay, then the next one is the S1 register where I can monitor the flex, okay? The TDRD flex uh, just now that I mentioned. Okay, and the RDRF. So these are the two main flags that we will be looking at. All right, and of course, besides this, okay, you also have these four other flags that actually tell us if there's any error. Okay, if there's any error with the incoming data. Okay, so this is the uh, software. Okay, we will look at that uh, later. All right, once we are looking at the sample code. So this part, I'll keep it first. All right, and when we look at a sample code, then we will come back to this and see. All right, uh, so what we will do now is, okay, I will not go through the code now. Okay, I will, we will go for a break now. When we come back from the break, okay, we will go through the code and we look at the demo. And then from there, we will understand how it works, okay, and uh, what you're going to be doing for this week's lab. All right, so uh, let's go for a break now. Now it's almost 10, okay, so about 10, 10, I'll see you all back here. And then we'll go through the code, okay, and then uh, see what's happening. Okay, so I'll see you all back here in uh, 10 minutes time. Okay, so um, welcome back. Let's uh, continue with the uh, review of the code.
Okay, so for this, um, basically, uh, I just got to go through the init UART two function, so you understand what needs to be done. All right. Um, okay, so I think from here maybe I can switch over to the code here. It'll be easier to see. All right. So for the init UART two, okay. So basically, you are going to be using the uh, you can configure the RGB LED if you want, all right? And then at the same time, uh, we are going to configure the uh, UART module. Okay, so to configure the UART module, firstly, we need to pass in uh, what baud rate we want to operate at. Okay, the uh, baud rate at which we are interested in. So if you look over here, okay, when I call this function, uh, okay, this baud rate, value okay is defined as uh, 9600 okay so this is basically uh, this is again uh, a sample okay just to demonstrate how the module is uh, UR module is going to be working all right later on of course uh, you can change this depending on the device you are connecting to all right so for the init UR2 we are going to uh, configure it for 9600 uh, bps all right, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to enable the clock for both the UR2 module and the port E module. Okay, so the UR2 module is in SCGC4. Uh, we saw that just now. And the uh, port E, all the ports are in uh, SCGC5. Okay, so by now you should be a bit more familiar with this uh, approach of programming and using all the built-in um, uh, macros or definitions where they have already uh, masked the particular bits that we want. All right, so you can uh, straight away use them. All right, and the all operation will ensure that the power is switched on. Okay, next is the configuration of the max. Okay, as we saw just now, all right, the port E22 and 23, they are both uh, UART under the alternate for function, okay? So what I need to do is I need to make sure that I have a definition for this. Okay, so for UART TX and UART RX port E22 and 23, if you go to definition, I've put the number here as 22 and 23. Okay, so this will make sure that the, uh, when I call this, this is first, uh, directly talking to the port E uh, pin control register for 22, pin 22. Okay, and then a port E pin control register for pin 22 over here. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, again, I think what we'll be doing for all the labs, the first step is to clear the bits of the current max operation. Okay, so I do an end with the complement of the mass and then I all with the exact value I want. So in this case, I want a value of four uh, because that is the max setting for both the, uh, the alternate function. Okay, so after I do that for pin 22 and 23, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to uh, disable the transmit and receive. Okay, so the TE and RE, okay, under UR2, C2. So let's go there, UR2. So under your uh, data sheet here. Okay, so there's a UR1 and UR2. So that is which register? Uh, register C2. You are uh, 2 C2 here. Yeah. Okay, so one thing you'll notice is uh, for most of the UART registers, okay, they are actually 8 bit registers. Okay, uh, so again, some registers may be 32 bits, some may be 8 bits, and so on. So it all depends on how they have designed their controller. So the UART control registers, most of them, okay, are actually 8-bit registers. Okay, so you can see over here that the TE and RE, okay, the TE and RE is to enable or disable the transmitter. 
Okay, so why we want to disable it? Because we are now setting it up. Okay, so we do not want to, uh, we just want to make sure that it is switched off before we change any configurations. Okay, so we are switching it off first. Okay, and then we are going to configure them. So the first thing you want to configure is the board rate. Okay, so this one uh, is something uh, that you need to take note of. Okay, the default system clock, okay, let's say we are running at 20 point uh, something megahertz or the 48 megahertz, whatever clock rate you're running in, okay, you're configured for. Okay, the bus clock for the UR is actually half of that. Okay, so this is again, uh, the way the internal clocking is configured. All right, uh, so different peripherals or different subsystems, we get different clocks, okay, from uh, uh, the way the, the clock management system is designed is like that, where different clocks goes to different peripheral subsystems. So the way the KL25Z is designed is that the bus clock, that means the clock that is power, going to be used in the UART module is actually half of the system clock. Okay, so we need to make sure we do this first to take that into account that the bus clock is half of the system clock. Okay, then the next step is figuring out the baud rate value. So the baud rate value, I mean the value that you want to put into the register, okay, for the particular baud rate that we want. Okay, so this is actually from the nodes itself. That's not the formula we used. this one okay where the board rate is equals to the you want module clock divided by sbr times 16 okay so the thing that we need to find out is the sbr value which is the value that you divide into the board rate register to make sure that the correct board rate comes out okay so just rearrange this okay you'll get this all right so the divisor comes here and the board rate comes here okay so this divisor is actually the value you want to put into the registers Okay, so the bus clock we know, the board rate we know that is 9600, and this 16 is because of the over uh, sampling. Okay, so the UART1 and UART2 have a built in over sampling of 16 times. Okay, so that is why you have to do this. Okay, once you do this, okay, uh, I mean, once you compute the value, okay, that is a 13 bit value. All right, so what you need to do is you need to make sure that the Correct value goes in the two different registers, BDH and BDL. Okay, so if you come back here, okay, so the BDH and BDL. So the board rate register low, okay, is the eight bits, lower eight bits, and the board rate register high is the upper four bits, okay, of the uh, BDH register. Okay, so we have a 13 bit value that we need to split into two registers. Okay, so that is why we need to do these two lines here. Okay, that is to update the correct value into both the registers so we get the board rate that we want. Okay, and then the last step here is the C1, S2, and C3, we are both all setting to zero. Okay, so C1, S2, and C3, these registers are associated with the parity, the number of bits, the frame format, and things like that. All right, so, I mean, if you look into the data sheet, okay, uh, you will see that there are a lot of different options you can have. That means you can swap the data uh, from most significant to least significant. You can flip the bits, that means a zero become one, one become a zero, and so on. So there are a lot of different things you can do. Uh, to, to change how the data is going to be represented when it comes out, okay? Uh, so we're not going to do anything like that. We're going to take it as it is. So no parity and eight bit data. So we're not using seven bit or nine bit or anything like that. So since we're not changing anything here, we can just set all these three registers to zero, okay? And with all of that configuration done, okay, then you can go ahead to enable the TX and RX. So when you say enable the TX and RX, basically what happened is from this moment on, your transmit module and receive module are both functioning. Okay, they are both functioning. Okay, now what is the next step? The next step is to transmit or receive. What can I do? Okay, so to transmit data, okay, what you can do is you can check and wait until the 
10 bit data register empty bit is set. Okay, so once the bit is set, then you know that the, uh, there is no data uh, or the transmit data register uh, is empty. And so you can write a new data to the URT2 uh, URT D register. This is the data register. So I take a new uh, data and write to the D register means what will happen is since the data register is empty, it will now transfer it to the shift register and will start to shift data out. All right. So that is to transmit. Again, this is the polling approach. The next one is the receive. Okay, to receive data, I just uh, check whether the receive data register flag is full or not. Okay, so as long as it is not full, then I wait. Okay, the moment it is full, that means I know a new data has come in. Then I just retrieve the data by looking at the D register. Because once the data has been shifted in, it will automatically be transferred to the D register. Okay, and I can retrieve the data. Okay, so these are the two things to do the transmit and receive in the polling mode. Okay, so now the last part here is uh, with all of that done. Okay, all you can do if you want to just test it out is you can do a simple transmit home. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing a transmit of some just some uh, fixed byte data here, and then I do a delay. So this is going to be going on in a loop. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to keep transmitting data. Okay, so that is the whole uh, software part. Now let's go ahead to look at the uh, hardware configuration. Okay, so for the hardware configuration, uh, we are using pin 22 and 23. Okay, so the 22 here is to transmit and 23 is to receive. Okay, so over here, Basically, what I need to do is I need to make sure that the, this pin here, this is the transmit, the pin 22. Okay, so for this connector, one, two, the third pin up. Okay, so that is where I'm connecting my scope to, okay, to check on the signal. And then the one over here, the white color is the ground. Okay, the white color here is the ground. Okay, so you can use any ground. Okay, so uh, on your uh, care to buy that, there's a few ground pins. Right? So any of them you can use. So I'm using the one over here, which is the uh, bottom right connector, okay, pin 14 there. Okay, so with that, uh, okay, we can actually go ahead to uh, download the code, okay, and run it. Okay, so let me uh... Okay, so now the code is already running. Uh, let me show you the Okay, so if you look here, uh, basically what you observe is okay. What you're observing here is the data being transmitted. Okay, so what is the data being transmitted? Zero x three one. So where is this zero x three one? So if you look back over here, okay, the transmit block. Okay, transmits the least significant bit first okay followed by the uh up to the most significant bit all right and then the uh, start and the stop bit so basically what you expect to see is you expect to see that the line is initially high this is the idle line okay and then zero x three one that i'm uh, transmitting all right that means it is in terms of binary it is zero zero one one zero 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 one Okay, and since I am uh, transmitting the least significant bit first up to the most significant bit, so what will happen is the first thing that will happen is 
I'll go low. This will be my start bit. Okay, my start bit. Okay, uh, followed by the one. Okay, which is the uh, least significant bit. So this is the least significant bit. All right, then followed by three zeros. One, two, three. So three zeros. So it'll be one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, which is this. And then one, one, zero, zero. So it become one, one, then zero, zero. Okay, and then the uh, stop bit. Okay, so the stop bit will be uh, pulling it back to high. Okay, and then it will just stay as high. You go back to the idle state. All right, so that is basically this what you are observing here. Okay, so you can see here. Okay, you can see the, the same values here. Okay, so the zero, the start bit, followed by the one least significant bit, followed by three zeros, all right, and then the one, one, and then zero, zero, and then the stop. That's the same thing that you're seeing here. Now, if you were to zoom in over here to look at the timing, okay, so let me just show you the measurement cursor. Uh, So if you see the timing value here, it's around 9,600, 9.6 okay, kilohertz. Okay, which is around the um, value that we configure for 9,600 bits per second. Okay, so that is basically the first step, okay, for you to do. All right, so if you look back at your uh, lab manual, okay, uh, after you do the questions and all, all right, is to have a capture of the data that represents the signal being transmitted. Okay, and of course do a measurement to ensure you're having the correct port rate. All right, so this sort of uh, ensures that you are having the correct setting and the configuration, okay, uh, from the UART side. So right now what is happening is your UART is just transmitting some uh, fixed data. Correct, right. and we're just trying to check that the all the necessary configuration is there. You know, your UART module is working correctly at the at the set board rate. Okay, then what you need to do next is you need to go through these three documents. Okay, that I've also uploaded. All right, and over here, what you need to do is you need to start to get uh, the ESP32 configured correctly. Okay, so the ESP32 is basically the uh, additional bot we are using. Okay, so if you look at the uh, two, okay, so the first document is just to get started, make sure you flash it in correctly uh, and the Wi-Fi module, everything is working. All right, so that is the first one. The next one is to configure the uh, bot rate, the SSID, the password, everything. All right, and to make sure that you, uh, to make your life easier, I also show you the steps to uh, have a static IP. Also, with a static IP, what happens is subsequently you just need to uh, use the same IP whenever you power up your ESP32. Okay, so I've given you all the steps in the document over here. Okay, so the one thing I forgot to upload is the uh, actual Arduino code. Okay, I will do that in a while. All right, so once you have the uh, ESP32 flash with this code, okay, what will happen is subsequently. Uh, when you have your own hotspot, okay, and you connect to the hotspot, okay, uh, that means your IP, your ESP32 connected to your own hotspot, and you use a browser to 
or the same hotspot to go to your IP address, okay, you will be able to access it. Okay, and what you can see is you can actually see that your Wi-Fi is connected. Okay, through the return message that you see on the display. Okay, and once you do that, okay, basically what you can do is you can actually uh, just using the IP address alone, okay, uh, with the code that I'm giving you, you just put on rate or uh, off rate, okay, you will actually be able to on and off the uh, LED, okay, that is connected to one of the pins on the ESP32. Okay, so this interface, as you can see, is very much just a web-based interface, right? which means that actually you can go ahead to design your user interface whichever way you like. Okay, so there is no particular restriction that it has to be an app on the phone. Uh, but like I said, the uh, advantage is you need to move around with the robot okay, while you're controlling it in the challenge. Okay, so having it on a phone is of course a lot more convenient. Okay, uh, so the way you want to create your interface is up to you because as long as you can access the IP address and send commands, then you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do already. Correct? Because what is happening here in this example is you are now sending commands to the ESP32 to the web interface to control a hardware connected to the ESP32. Okay, so that is the first step. So I, here I also given you the idea of how you can use the App Inventor 2. Okay, so the App Inventor 2 uh, is quite a well-established platform, all right, uh, to create mobile apps very easily, okay, uh, where anybody can do it, okay, so you don't need any particular background knowledge at all. All right, so it's a drag and drop interface. Anybody can do it. Uh, so for many years, it was only available for Android phones. Recently, they have started supporting iOS devices. Okay, but the iOS development, I am not really keeping track of it. Okay, so I'm not sure to what extent uh, it still is compatible. Okay, maybe some things are, maybe some things are not. Okay, so if you do not have a IO, uh, Android device in your team, it means all of you are Apple lovers, all right, then you can look, think of other ways to implement this. Okay, like I said, since it's a web-based interface, anything that you want to do is fine, all right? But if you have an Android phone, then using the App Inventor tool is probably one of the easier ways to do it, okay? So this is the first, uh, the second document you must go through to make sure that you are able to do the sort of basic LED control with the uh, app interface, okay? Uh, the next step is, okay, we are going to make sure that we are able to con control the KL25Z with the ESP32, okay? So to do that, what we are going to do is, we are going to do a connection, okay, between the, uh, ESP32 and the KL25Z. Okay, so the ESP32, okay, uh, we're going to configure the UART module. Okay, but since the ESP32 is basically an Arduino based device, all right, it is quite straightforward. So we'll just make use of the libraries to configure the, uh, the UART module and send the data over. Okay, and the KL25Z will now receive the data. All right, so this is where you need to make sure that the board rate setting for the ESP32 is also 9,600 BPS and we do this connection. Okay, you must also remember that the ground and the ground must also be connected. Okay, and once that is done, your KL25Z, okay, all you need to do is to, in the polling mode, you just need to receive the information. Okay, you need to receive the uh, data by calling this receive poll. Okay, and then once you receive the information, you decode it, okay, and then you control the LED. So this sort of shows you the connection. So it's only two wires only, huh? one for the data and one for the ground. All right, and once you're done with that, you should be able to now control the RGB LED on your KL25Z. Okay, so that should be the ultimate goal. That means you are now using the web interface, okay, to directly control the KL25Z board, okay? 
So the first step is making sure the ESP32 port is responding, the LED connected to the ESP32 is responding. The next step is now, instead of just controlling the LED on the first breadboard, you're going to send the data over to the KL25Z and let the RGB LED respond. Okay, so that is where this interface comes in. Okay, so let, let me just uh, show you the protocol. Okay, again, this is just a, a sample only. Okay, so what I'm uh, what I did is basically, since I'm sending uh, one byte of data at a time, all right, so I sort of just decided, okay, I will set aside first four bits to indicate that it is uh, uh, LED control, RGB LED control, and then the lower four bits to sort of indicate which LED and whether it's going to be on or off. All right, so this is just, again, anything okay up to you to decide okay there's no right or wrong okay you decide how you want to design the protocol okay uh so let me show you on the kl25z okay uh, basically how it looks like okay so on the kl25z basically what will happen is after i receive my data okay in this case i just do a masking to see what is the function. Is it LED function? Is it motor function? Is it audio function? Whatever. And then once I mask out the upper four bits, I know what to do. Then I do the lower four bits masking to figure out whether I should off or on any particular LED. So again, all this is just controlling the end device, whether it's LED or motor up to you. All right, the important thing is when I receive the data, am I receiving it correctly? Once I can receive whatever I send, then there's no, no issue already. Okay, there's no issue in uh, sort of uh, making sure everything falls in place. Okay, and then let me just uh, show you the app inventor part over here. Okay, so the app inventor part, okay, if you have already tried it, okay, then you are familiar with what I'm showing you. If not, you can. So I'll try it when you're free. Okay, so in the app inventor, you can design the UI whatever way you like. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, there is there are no marks for the user interface control. Okay, so you can just if you want to make it text based, also you can make it text based. All right, all right, but I think it will be quite painful to keep on sending text strings. Okay, or typing out text string during the competition. All right, so having buttons is of course a lot easier. All right, and then over at the uh, block side, you can see that all I need to do is I configure my, um, sorry, my buttons to send the appropriate sort of uh, command to the IP address. All right, so on rate, off rate, or whatever. Okay. And let me just show you the last part, the Arduino part. Okay, the ESP32 part. Okay, so this is the file I have not uploaded. I will upload it today. Okay, so once you collect the bots, you can uh, uh, you can try it out. Okay, so all of this part where I already explained uh, with the comments, all I will not go through. Okay, so what I will want to uh, show is this, where what I do here is I configure the serial. Okay, so there is two, uh, or the serial here is basically two. One is serial the begin, the other is serial two the begin. Okay, this serial the begin, you can see the border is 11520. This is because of the serial monitor. Okay, and the connection to the to the uh, board to do the flashing of the program. Okay, then uh, the ESP32 has a few serial ports as well. So we are using the serial port two. Okay, so that's why we use serial two to begin. So this is to configure the 9600 BPS to transmit data over to the KL25Z. Okay, so that is the part where we are sort of setting up the interface with the KL25Z. All right, and over here, uh, what we do is, uh, so this is where you check for the button, uh, which button is being pressed. Okay, and for the button being pressed, all right, 
what we need to do is we need to send the appropriate command. Okay, th these two lines over here, digital right and all this one is just to control the LED connected to the ESP32. Okay, but that is not important. The important part is whether I can take this data and send the serial uh, data over to the uh, KL2 by that. So this is uh, where you check which sort of uh, uh, IP address you're sort of sending okay, across the interface. So is it the on rate, is it the off rate or whatever? And then based on that, I send the appropriate serial command. So three one is to on, three zero is to off. Again, this is, again, depending on how you have uh, configured your, your, your data, okay, your protocol. Okay, so uh, once you get all of this, this uh, Friday, you can go ahead and try. Okay, so of course it's good to, you know, make sure that everybody sort of, uh, does their part. So it's not one person trying to do everything, you know, split it up among the team. So some of you can do the KL25Z part, some of you can do the ESP32 part, okay, and then and then another person can maybe try to look at the app or user interface part, all right, and then start to put things together. All right, so basically, um, this is what you need to do. Uh, I wanted to do a demo, but my Wi-Fi hotspot is having some issue. Okay, so what I will do is once I resolve that, I will take some video and I will share with you all. So you sort of understand the whole flow of what is happening. Okay, uh, but I think what I've sort of shown you the code and everything, you should get a good idea. All right, um, so basically for the, uh, this is already week six, all right? So what you need to do, this week's demo is basically the one on the, uh, what was it? Was it interrupt one? Which was the one that was due last week? Uh, PWM, okay. So basically, uh, yeah. So you need to do the uh, the one that was due last week, this week, all right? Uh, yeah. And then uh, this uh, interface, the UART one, you have more time. Okay, so I'll give you another recess week plus another Two more weeks okay to work on this and then finish up this uh, part okay to do the last demo all right so this UART uh, interface with the app and the ESP32 will be the last uh, demo you need to do for the lab all right and why this is the last demo because uh, with this uh, you can be quite confident that you already have all the basic building blocks in place Okay, then the rest of it will be all the, the OS that will run on top of it and make use of all these uh, library functions. Okay, so the demo you're going to do for this app and the ESP32, I will, I will up, update the document. So that is the last demo you need to do. Okay, so I'll give you more time. So that will be another two weeks after the recess week. Okay, so you have more than enough time to, to go through all the document, prepare your ESP32, your KL25Z, and some interface, okay, to send some commands. Okay, even if you have not done the app, you, you can just use a browser and just send the commands over. Okay, that is also fine. All right, so that will ensure that you have all the blocks there. And then when you are, when we start with the OS and we start to put everything together, then you can see everything sort of, all in place. Okay. All right. So that's all we have for today. All right. Um, okay. So basically, we have covered all the hardware uh, and the KL25Z building blocks. Okay. And now the next step is to now move towards the OS, which will be another interesting um, sort of section where you will learn a lot of very nice stuff. Okay. And I'm trying to incorporate a few more. Uh, nice things that you can also learn about. And uh, you know, uh, even though you may not need to use it for the project, it will still be very good for you as uh, learning is concerned. Okay, so I will add on all those stuff and I will update the, the, the plan. Okay, so that's all we have, all right. Um, so this week, when you go to the lab, you please remember to, uh, I, I already told the TAs, you'll be drawing out, each of you individual will be drawing out your own ESP32. 
Okay, so each of you have your own KL25Z and the ESP32. All right. Um, so when are the midterms? So the midterms, you will follow the schedule that is in uh, Luminous. Okay, so let me uh, open it up. Okay, so you'll follow the schedule here, which is in week 10. Okay. Okay, so it might be, I might push it earlier to week 9, okay, but I will update you. Okay, so you'll be either in week 9 or week 10. Alright, uh, I think last time I had it in week 10 because of some public holiday that happened to come, okay, but I think now we don't have. So let me uh, update you, okay, by the end of the week, okay, it might be in either week 10 or might be in week 9. Okay, so I'll update you and uh, confirm this, all right, but either way it should be fine because it is a scheduled uh, lecture slot. All right, so uh, there is no issue of clash with anything. All right, so it'll be either week 10 or week 9. Uh, let me update you all by the end of this week and confirm. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right, if you have any, any questions, you can uh, let me know. If not, uh, okay, uh, just remember to collect all your new stuff uh, this uh, Friday.